Good morning, everyone. Let's come on back to our seats and gather back in. Great to have you with us this Sunday. Shake that last hand, say that last hello. We'll gather back in here. All right. Fantastic. Well, welcome to Morning Star Church this morning. My name is Rick Mullen. I'm part of the pastoral team here. And it is my privilege to welcome you to our Sunday service on this Easter Sunday. We're so glad you joined us. Oh, man, we had a big crowd this morning at 7 a.m. for the sunrise service. It was awesome outside. And so we're so glad to have these opportunities together to worship our King together. So we're glad you're here. If you're new to us, maybe this is your first Sunday or maybe you've come a couple times. We'd love to connect with you. One easy way we do that is by a connection card. You can scan that code and one will pop up on your phone or you can pull one of these out of your chair pocket there in front of you. Either way, fill it out. Stop by our connection desk on your way out and we've got a gift we'd love to give you and say hello this morning. Awesome. Well, i got a couple opportunities coming up this week that I want to make you aware of. On Wednesday, Turning Point USA is hosting a Charlie Kirk Live Free Tour right here on the KU campus. That's right, it's going to be awesome. It's going to be an awesome time. He's going to talk about freedom in America, what it means for us to stand up for that. And, you know, there's a lot of stuff on the college campuses. And Charlie and Turning Point USA is going around to campuses all over the country during this spring talking about freedom and, and what it, how it is so important to who we are. And especially, you know, those who love God understand that he is the God of freedom. He wants us to have freedom to serve him and love him and to speak his word and his truth. So Charlie's going to be up at Budick Hall on KU's campus. You need tickets, and they're free. You can scan that code and get one. Um, you have to have a ticket to get in, but they're free. And we hope to see you at 6.30 up on the KU campus Wednesday night to see Charlie Kirk live in person. All right, ladies, for you, Thursday night, coming up, Holistic Womanhood event, the last one of the year. This one's going to be special because it's talking about men and women. Yeah, it's going to be a good one. Things you wish you were told, things you wish you knew. All right, so this is going to be a good time. There's even going to be some guys there, I guess. They're going to share some thoughts, so look out. Should be interesting. It's going to be a good time. 6.30 Thursday right here at Morningstar. Those are our big events coming up this week. Hope you can join us for those. Let's turn now to our time of giving. This is where we take up our tithes and offerings, and there's three ways you can give. You can text to give. You can give online or you can use the envelope in the chair back and drop it in the box in the lobby on your way out. But let's pray and go to God as we pray for our tithes and offerings. Father, we thank you this morning for your glorious goodness to us. God, we cannot say it enough how awesome of a king you are. Yes, Lord. Savior, Lord, and King. So God, we worshiped you this morning. We continue to worship you with our breath, Lord, with our life, and with everything we have, the resources that you bless us with. So God, as we give this morning, may it be used for your kingdom advancing work in our midst and in our city. We praise you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Pastor John. All right. Thank you, Rick. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. You know, what a fitting verse for this great day. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is the greatest victory in history, without a shadow of a doubt. You know, when I think about what, I thought about this, what makes, you know, a victory great? What does it make? What is it dependent upon? I thought about three things. Three things that really defines the degree of greatness of victory is. Number one is the most important, who won? Yeah. Right? Who won? You know, what, what's their story? What's, what was their motivation? Why did they want to win or have victory? You know, it's so important when you think about that. When they talk about the resurrection of Jesus, it's, man, Jesus is the one who won. Right? He won. And his motivation was incredible, phenomenal. To set free all those who would believe. The second thing is not as important, but it is significantly important. 
Who lost? Right? Who lost? Because the greater the opposition, the uglier the antagonist, the greater the victory. The greater the opposition, the greater the victory. Now, you know, just as a, a, a side story, years ago, I did a little basketball coaching. And I had the privilege of coaching these fourth graders, a group of nice young boys, fourth graders. And, uh, you know, I, I, was, I was really, didn't know much about X and O's. I was predominantly about hype and passion. And so, you know, they had this habit of coming, like if we were in a little local tournament or something, they would have this habit of asking me, Coach, who are we playing? Who we play next? And then one day I just decided, you know, I'm just going to do something. You know, I had seen the team. It wasn't that significant of a team. You know, that this was a pretty good little team that, that, of talent that, that was, was playing, these fourth graders. And so they, they came up to me in this tournament and said, Coach, who are we playing next? I said, we're playing the gorillas. And I saw them play. This team is a bunch of bad dudes, man. They are, man, they are tough. They're strappy. They're physical. One guy, I think, has a mustache. And another guy, I think, is chewing tobacco. I mean, you know, as I was passing their huddle after one of their games, I thought I heard them say they knew they were going to play called the greatness. And I heard them say, yeah, we're going to beat them so bad they will think that we ripped their arms off and beat them with them. And they're like, I said, but you know what? I believe in you. I believe in you. I believe you can do it. You know, if we play how we have been playing, if we play up to our ability, if we give it everything we got, you know, we can win. But then I'd always finish with this. But win or lose, we're going to Dairy Queen. <laughs> you know, fitting. Jesus said to his disciples, I'm the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live, right? I mean, you know, that's pretty phenomenal. That we really, the fact of the resurrection, you know, is this, is this message to our hearts that we don't have to fear death, that we don't have to be slaves of fear, you know, because at the end, you know, we're going to have life and have it eternally. That is a force. And why the resurrection today is coming under, you know, so much attack. Because what the, what the opposition wants you not to remember and not to know is the power of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And it's work in us. And the third thing is, what did it mean? What did the victory mean? What did it accomplish? Like just, there's nothing more significant than what was accomplished through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. It, it, it's, it's just of such magnitude. So I want us just to look at the story of the resurrection. You know, you know, we'll start with, you know, Jesus was betrayed by Judas, who was one of his followers, betrayed by him. He was arrested by the temple guards. He was denied by Peter, not just a disciple, but a very close disciple. He was interrogated by the Sanhedrin, the religious leaders, interrogated by them. He was slandered by false witnesses. He was rejected by the crowd who chose Barabbas, a murderer. He was stripped, mocked, and crowned with thorns by the Roman guards. Spat on, whipped, beat, and then he was sent out to carry his own cross. We join this story in Luke 23. It says two others who were criminals were led away to be put to death with him. And when they came to the place that is called the skull, which is so interesting, the skull, the place of, of the skull, or Golgotha, or Calvary, you know, the skull. There's two reasons why it was called the skull. One, 
you know, naturally. It has kind of a looks like this, this hill kind of has a formation that reminds one of a, of a skull. But not only that, there's a lot of projection and thought that this is where David buried Goliath's head after he removed Goliath's head from him. So that was a great victory too. So on this place, it's called the skull. There they crucified him and the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. And Jesus said, in the midst of all this, Jesus said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. What do you call that? I call that winning. Jesus is winning even as he's been crucified. And they cast lots to divide his garments. And the people stood by watching, but the ruler scoffed at him, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself. If he is the Christ of God, his chosen one. The soldiers also mocked him, coming up and offering him sour wine, and saying, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was also an inscription over him in, the, in what they thought was a mocking tone, but they said, this is king of the Jews. One of the criminals who were hanged railed at him saying, are you not Christ? Listen to this. Save yourself and us. It was now about the sixth hour and there was darkness. There was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour, while the sun's light failed and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Then Jesus, calling out with a loud voice, said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And he said this, he breathed his last. Now, when the centurion saw what had taken place, this Roman centurion, when he saw what had taken place, he praised God, saying, certainly this man was innocent. And all the crowds that had assembled for this spectacle, when they saw what had taken place, returned home beating their breasts. And all his acquaintances and the women who had followed him from Galilee stood at a distance watching this. You know, the Apostles' Creed, which is basically what you could say was the was kind of the historic statement of faith. It has a portion where it says this. He suffered under Pontius Pilate. Was crucified. Died and was buried. And then this line. He descended to hell. Now this idea of hell is maybe what we've come to understand in terms of just levels of different different descriptions of hell, but what really what it was the Sheol, the place of the dead, the underworld he went. In 1 Peter 3.18 it says this, for Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that, hang, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. And then this, in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison because they formerly did not obey when God's patience waited in the days of Noah. Wait, wait, who were these spirits in prison from the days of Noah who did not obey? So, so he descended and began to make proclamations to these spirits in prison. Who are these? Well, Jude 6 tells us this about these 
spirits. And the angels who did not stay within their own position, they did not obey, they rebelled. And the angels who did not stay within their own position of authority, but left their proper dwelling, he is kept in eternal chains under gloomy darkness until the judgment of the great day. These are, these are the spirits from Genesis 6 that God sent and had them chained and put in prison. So I want you to think about this. So Jesus dies, he descends, and he makes proclamation. So imagine how, he, how, how at this moment he's descending. And these rebellious spirits in prison see him descending. And you can just, and I'm paraphrasing, but they say, Aha! Ha ha! We got you, son of God. Jesus begins to make proclamation. Oh, no, 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 no. We're here now, but you're staying. I'm not. And he ascends to the right hand of the Father. Peter goes on to say, and this is so important and significant, about water baptism and how, how this ties in with water baptism. That, that water baptism is a type of the death, burial, and resurrection, right? If, for those who've been water baptized or those who've not yet been water baptized. It's ess in essence, it's a way of making proclamation that you repent, you turn to follow Jesus, you go under the water, you die, you go into the waters as a statement to who? The forces of darkness. And as you go in the water and then you come out, the statement is, you lost another one. How powerful this is. It's, it's, it's a proclamation. It's kind of like going into the enemy's locker room and saying, man, we beat the tar out of you. God bless you. Now Jesus is raised again, and we, 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 we should read or continue to read or first read the story of his resurrection. But something that's striking, you know, to me even now, uh, but, but it's in a way understanding that the resurrection of Jesus, the victory of Jesus' resurrection was surprising and was so magnificent. It was surprising and unexpected. Why? Remember what it said. They saw all those things happen from a distance on Calvary. The place of the skull. They saw him crucified. They saw him pierced. They saw him breathe his last. So when Jesus rose and appeared to them, it's, you talk about cognitive dissonance. It's, it's, it's just, so they're, they're kind of dismayed. Why? Because of the profound, enormous victory. It's beyond human comprehension. But they progressed in their faith. They did. They began to progress in their faith so much just after, you know, a couple of weeks. They find themselves at the day of Pentecost in Jerusalem, filled with the Holy Spirit. And they stand up in Jerusalem, and this is what they say. This Jesus God raised up, and of, all, of that we are all witnesses with great confidence and boldness. You know, what an amazing thing. The light breaks through. The darkness cannot overcome it. You know, how often in our own life we need to realize that certain places that may seem dark or hopeless that the resurrection of Jesus Christ speaks to our hearts, it speaks to our soul that can cause us to know, man, the darkness is trying to overcome it, but it won't. It can't. Romans 8, 11 says this, if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit who dwells in you. 
You know, the promise that Paul told the church in Philippi. He says, man, that I might know him and the power of his resurrection. The power, that I might know the power of his resurrection. Yes, it's to understand the power of his victory in our lives through the Spirit of God. The power that causes us to rise up. Know the power of his resurrection. So when we think about this, you know, we, we just ponder again the resurrection. Who won? The greatest victory. Who won? Jesus. Did not only Jesus, we win. We won. Who lost? All the forces of darkness lost. And what did it mean? It means that the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is alive and at work now in our mortal bodies, giving us life. Well, we already have life, Pastor John. No, God's kind of life. Doesn't mean everything's going to turn up roses. Doesn't mean you're not going to have any challenges. But it means that there's something in your heart that can withstand, that can resist, that can become a force through the power of the Holy Spirit. Again, John 1, verse 4, In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. You know, what do we want to do when we think, what do we want to think about when we leave here? We want to think about what Jesus accomplished is the greatest victory. We also want to think about this, that through his victory, we have victory. Unlike my little fourth grade basketball team years ago, hey, win or lose, win or lose, you know, it takes the pressure off, win or lose, we're going to Dairy Queen. The message that Jesus has for us today is in the economy of God, we win. And we go be with him forever. We're going there. If you believe, we're going to win. We're winning. Let's stand up. I want to pray for us. Father, I just thank you for this morning. Lord, when in many ways, Lord, just uh, this, this hour in which we live, Lord, it is an amazing hour. And just like your victory was the, the measure of its greatness was because of the adversaries. Lord, we thank you, Father, that you give us victory. You give us great victory. Lord, you call us to see who you who our calling, who you've made us to be. Lord, I just pray right now against any false humility. Lord, any kind of self-justification or, or trusting in our own morality, but Lord, by trusting in what you've done on the cross, that Lord, through that faith in what you did, Lord, you empower us to bring about transformation and change and victory, Lord, progressive victory in our heart and life, Lord, that we don't have to settle Lord, but we can advance, Lord God. We don't always have to be on the defensive, Lord, but we can be on the offensive. Lord, we just thank you, Lord, for your goodness. Lord, we thank you for your power at work within us. Lord, we thank you, Lord, that you give us eyes to see and to understand that the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is alive and at work in us to give us the life that you've always wanted to give us, the true life, the Zoe, the God kind of life. Lord, I just thank you, Lord, by your grace. You cause us to increase and to grow. Lord, I thank you for every single heart here this morning. Lord, I just pray for their heart to be turned by the Holy Spirit to see you as not only the King of kings and the Lord of lords, but Lord, the one who paid the price for each of us, who gave up his life. He didn't have to go to the cross, but because he loved 
the world, he gave his only son, Jesus, for us. We thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.